The following program is produced by Marshfield Community Television. The impact on the Wisconsin Pinery. Uh, here's contact information. I'll skip over that. If anybody wants to talk later, I'd m more than happy to, and I'll give you a card later, but to save time, we'll move right along. I graduated from the University of Minnesota College of Forestry a long time ago. I spent 40 years with Wisconsin DNR, the last 30 in the Northwest uh, with the Cumberland area. I'm presently president of the Barron County Woodland Owners, and I've got in excess of 11 hours research into what was the largest lumber company in the entire world, Knapp Stout out of Menominee. Okay, uh, <clears throat> for this presentation and for anything else, I want to introduce you to a wonderful professor. Uh, he's uh, deceased at this time, Paul Wallace Gates of Cornell University, the finest author on land, uh, the, the, the development of the public land and really aspects related to the Wisconsin, Minnesota, Michigan primary, uh, pinery. He is, uh, he packs more into one page than most professors do into chapters. Uh, I have here, uh, well, we, we, maybe m many of you know about the Wisconsin Pinelands at Cornell University, one of his books. But this is an even better book. It's the history of public land law development. And it's academic. But it's, a, and it's not one you want to read at night before you go to sleep because it is jam-packed with what happened behind the pinery and leading up to it. it it's, a, it's a really wonderful read. It's one of the few books where I couldn't wait to read footnotes. I couldn't wait to dig into the bibliography. And I don't say that much about professors. Okay, at the end or afterward, questions, feedback, challenges. I really want you to take that serious because I grow when you ask questions. Each of you have a different perspective on what words are said, and I very often am able to go back and re-research or refine research and get a lot out of questions and even challenges. I love challenges. Um, but that said, and, and just so that you keep in mind, Words matter. Sometimes I will use the wrong words and you will get the wrong impression or wonder about it. So uh, be free to uh, challenge. The next slide talks about words mattering. Here you have a couple of good old boys in a boat. Happens to be dogs. The, f the first one says, I thought you were bringing a bait. The other one says, no, I said I had worms. Well, they're both talking the same thing, but the, the communication isn't existing, so feel free to talk to me, okay? Uh, okay, we're going to talk about today's objectives. This is just some wording for you. Uh, but what we're going to do for today's talk is we're gonna, not talking about it at the saw level, the camp level, the sleigh level. We're going to be talking more of the strategic level because I'm often interested, I'm as interested in why the pinery happened in the way it happened as I am within the, uh, the details. Quite frankly, at this time, I think there are five uh, horsemen of the pinery that really have not been addressed in any of the literature I've seen. There are five reasons that occurred, when it did, how it did. And I'm gonna finish that research and may talk to you about it in the future. For today, we'll talk about some mega trends. We're gonna look at why the pinery went so fast it went from inexhaustible pine to bam, it's gone. Uh, and we're gonna roll, uh, examine the role of Southern secession. The next slide that you can't see uh, very well, but we're gonna muddle through it, is uh, basically the nation in 1870. And you'll notice that the Eastern states claimed clear out the Mississippi River, and then there was this thing called the Northwest Territory uh, that Wisconsin was in. Beyond that was Louisiana Territory, property of Spain. <coughs> um, okay, then along comes 1803 and the, the world changed. By this time, the eastern states had ceded their land over here 
They had given up those land claims and the federal government paid off their Civil War debts. By this time, we've had the Louisiana Purchase. Uh, Wisconsin is now part of the Michigan Territory, but it's still territory. It's not a state. It's not really, uh, it's part of the Big Empty. When you look to the west here, this is really the Big Empty. It's public domain largely, uh, occupied by a few fur trappers and mostly Native American tribes. Uh, but it has changed a lot. And it's really important to remember your, oh, your history from uh, high school is the Louisiana Purchase because it plays a big role. Well, what we had, we had all this empty domain. It is all owned by the federal government. And from 1803, well, 1815, because after the War of 1812 really settled the property line, so to speak, with Britain, there was not much action. Oh yeah, there was a couple land grants here and there was a little bit of, of uh, uh, other grants uh, to state, uh, pretty minor. And then we're going to look at the fact that in about eight, in the 1860s, things changed a lot. So it went 50 years with almost, almost nothing happening. And I asked, why? And then <coughs> uh, in the 1860s, quite a bit happened. Now, as I go through the next three slides, and I'm going to go through it quickly, have you heard of these acts of Congress? Yes. If you watch Badger basketball, Badger football, we've heard of that one. Have you heard of this one? Yes. The Transcontinental uh, Railroad Act. And how about this one? Yes. Pretty common. We all heard about them. I heard about them. I, but there was a stunner involved in learning. Because if you look at it, in less than six weeks, all three of these major acts came together. In 1862, from May 20 to July 2 of 18, and I'm going, wow, our Congress couldn't get them through in 60 years. Uh, why is that? And then I got thinking, whoa, this is, this is really odd. Uh, 11 times the area of the state of Wisconsin was all of a sudden taken from public domain and entered into the process of transferring it to primarily individuals or corporations in terms of the railroad who then was going to give it to, to the individuals. Just incredible. You'll probably never see this in, in at least the world history as it exists today. You'll never see it again. Uh, the question in my mind was, why did it take so long to get to 1862, and then why so fast? First of all, it took so long because of constitutional questions. Uh, President Buchanan from 56 to 1860 believed he did not have, nor did the Congress have, constitutional authority to put this land into play without a constitutional amendment. Then there was the Hamilton versus Jefferson philosophies, which ended up uh, being uh, Hamilton, of course, was into more the industrial age, the urban age. Uh, Jefferson was much more into the agrarian farmer and arguing for the American farmer and free soil. Uh, there should be free soil. Now, inherent in their various views, and Jefferson's side was to make that independent yeoman farmer. And on Hamilton's side, he wanted revenue. He wanted to sell the public domain for as much as possible. And these sides argued back and forth and back and forth. Then there were sectional rivalries. Basically, the East Coast versus the South versus the Northwest. The people in the Northwest said, we want that land for us. It's in Wisconsin, darn it. We get to sell it. It's ours. And the guys in the Northeast said, oh, no, you don't. Uh, no, you don't. It was our blood and treasure that won the revolution. It was our blood and treasure that won uh, the War of 1812. It's our blood and treasure that's protecting you Westerners from the ravages of the Native Americans. Uh, and of course, if it was to be given to the Wisconsin, for example, then the New Yorkers don't get anything out of it. That's not acceptable to them. So there was a lot of old state, new state. And then there was a really unique argument that echoed through the Congress and that is the industrialists in the East were afraid that this would drain all our workers from the factories or they'd have to pay higher wages. 
And so they were opposed to it within the Congress of the United States. And inherent in all of those is who made a buck on it? The people in Wisconsin wanted to get the land for them so that they could get a buck and sell it to settlers. And the people out east wanted it for something else. All right, on top of those uh, things that, that were happening within the Congress and the debates about these that, that uh, Gates, etc., talk about at some length and in some detail, there was, again, the states' rights popped up, particularly from the South, is that we have rights. But the Northwest was saying, which Wisconsin was part of the Northwest at that time, was saying, no, we also have rights. And then, so you had the federalism, whether there was going to be a strong central government or in a weaker states or strong states versus uh, a weak central government. That whole argument got in there. And then they started arguing. You had the Missouri Compromise of 1820. Then, the, then these other acts uh, that followed. We had all of these laws that were occurred during the uh, 1800s from 1820 on and it paralyzed the Congress. All of this stuff pr primarily was due to land and making uh, and the argument over Kansas and the Dred Scott. There was tremendous emotion in the country. And then toward the end of that period, you had the nativists, the know-nothings, anti-immigration. Uh, they were <coughs> particularly anti-immigration about Irish and Germans and Catholics. They didn't want them in the country. There was great opposition in the late 1800s to that. The know-nothings had secret codes. The fire eaters were a group in the South who just, starting in probably the mid-1840s, that simply wanted insurrection and secession. And they kept arguing it and trying to force it through their state cons uh, states. Um, but the other part that was really complicated is we had to have bisectional presidential uh, contests. If you were in the North and you had a president, you were running, a man you were running for president, you could not elect him and get enough in the electoral college to win. You had to get some support out of the South. If you were in the South, you had to get some support out of the North. And then each of them were jockeying with the states in the Northwest, uh, Ohio, Illinois, uh, and later Wisconsin. So there was a tremendous uh, amount of disputes going on within the Congress and it really paralyzed everything because these were so visceral. These were people arguing, uh, well, what they felt was for a lifestyle. Let's take a look at some attitudes of some of these uh, people related to, related to squatters, which took an, uh, a bad name later on. Henry Clay, the famous orator from the South, called them lawless rabble. The next one uh, basically was talking about speculators. Mis Mr. Galland of Iowa called them a graceless band of swindling scoundrels. And then the next group that we'll talk about is, is the homesteaders who have almost a sainted image today and they talked about it quite uh, quite a lot of being positive in even in the 1800s. Okay, here's homesteaders and basically here's some quotes. Vote yourself a farm, outrageous in principle and ad adverse to the best interests of the West. The effect will to be to bring upon us a vile horde of the most worthless class, class of immigrants, men who will not pay taxes and who will steal for a living. The poor houses of the East in all of Europe will be emptied upon us. I have not much sympathy for these cattle that were Cyrus Woodman of Mineral Point, Wisconsin. Cyrus Woodman simply just happened to have a land office, a uh, real estate business with Cadwalder Washburn. Uh, and they wanted, instead of direct homesteads, of course they wanted to have the, the land go through them for the homesteaders. So he had a private interest in that. The real reason for all this rationalizing really is a congressional fight over slavery. That was what was paralyzing up everything. 
there was lots of rationalizing and people would talk about state rights. They weren't really talking about state rights. They were talking about the institution of slavery. They called it that peculiar institution. From this, to show you the visceral nature of the, the argument within the Congress, here's a quote. Not in any uncommon lust for power did this uncommon tragedy have its origin. It is the rape of a virgin territory, compelling it to the hateful embrace of slavery. And it may be clearly traced to, the de to a depraved desire for a new slave state. Hideous offspring of such a crime in hope of adding to the power of slavery in the national government. That was Charles Sumner. I don't know if you remember him. This is about the Lee Compton debate related to the, the Constitution for the state of Kansas to become the proposed Constitution so they could become a, a state. He, had, he spoke for two days on slave, the slavery issue in the Congress, in the House of Representatives. And what did it get him? Here's why you might remember the name. On the floor of the House of Representatives of the U.S. Congress, he was beaten to a virtual pulp. It took him about two years to recover from this beating. That's how vicious this was. And neither side was going to let the other side get ahead of it. It's kind of like when I had my, my wife had two large orange tomcats. And if you let one of them out the door, whoosh, he, days later he showed up and so we were really frustrated what I learned the only way to deal with tomcats you get a leash you put one tomcat on each end and they don't get anywhere <laughs> um, why the fighting we've uh, basically talked a little bit about it and <laughs> here's the US map at that point in time uh, 1850 and about this time, there are about 15 slave states and 15 free states. And to the west of those states is all what you'd call empty country. The uh, Minnesota Territory, the unorganized territory, Utah, Oregon. And <coughs> as long as it was 15-15, with two senators per state, the South could block anything it wanted, and it did. This argument would have gone on for a great deal of time. At this time, the, the, the North, the, the, the free soil people, had the, the House of Representatives by far because the population North was perhaps twice what it was in the South, as long as they could maintain parity. But about this time, a little after this, and that's why the Kansas fight got so vicious, is the South could see that with all that unorganized territory, the new states that came in were going to be free states. And they were go then going to lose the vote in the Senate and possibly or probably get uh, slavery, um, slavery eliminated. And then in 1858, Minnesota came in to the uh, Union as a free state. And Oregon came in as a semi-free state because they had this unique thing in their state constitution excluding blacks from the state. And had a penalty for any ship captain who allowed one to escape off the ship. The whole fight in Congress was a fight over the control of the Congress. And, and as soon as Minnesota and Oregon came in, the southern states could see they were not going to win and they seceded. Uh, and when they seceded, it removed all objections, uh, well, not all, most of the objections to uh, land grants and other legislation in the House of Representatives. And the objections to free soil also left. Because if you go back to the election, uh, Lincoln's election, in the plank of his party was a, a free soil plank. So from here on, then, the, the North decided the future And the point is, is that secession meant war, and the war followed. Uh, but why in 1862? Why take time for land policy? I've heard it in the, from the audience here earlier. There were a lot of other things going on in 1862. Why is all of a sudden land policy and some dirt for a farmer so important that it gets elevated in the Congress and in, for the presidency? It was a time of crisis. These are just a few events. 
Lincoln was trying to hold the, the border states in. We had problems with uh, generals. We had problems with the Union Army getting run through the streets of Washington. Uh, <clears throat> if you simply take um, Shiloh and the Peninsula Campaign, the Union forces suffered 37,000 total casualties between April and May of 1862. If we had a conflict with 37,000 casualties in two months, you could bet the Congress would be too busy to play around with land policy unless it was a priority of highest means. And the reason they did deal with it because of fear and paranoia. <laughs> the Trent Affair occurred, which almost caused a, a third war with Britain. There were spies all over. If you want to read about this, there's a dozen or more books about spies from the rebel st uh, states up working in, from Washington to Montana to California. There were, some, uh, there were southern sympathizers all over the north making some sorts of uh, agitation about every battle that the north fought and it wasn't successful. There were newspaper editors in the north pounding the table and trying to reduce the morale of the northern people who had voted uh, <coughs> to go to war. Uh, and there was a great need for money and there were, that was part of the paranoia is the north was afraid that the south was going to uh, get money out of California, Montana and Colorado to fund its war effort. Without those monies it would be very difficult for. So there was a lot of fear, a lot of paranoia going on, but it gets more complicated. New York Times, January 26, 1861. If our representatives in Congress should be so foolish as to make any move, however slight, toward the establishment of a Pacific Republic, they may as well uh, order their coffins at once. This gets to a point where it, within California, particularly Southern California, there was a whole group of people with, who, who had strong Southern sympathies or uh, cussed uh, tendencies. And they wanted to create a new nation out of California, Oregon, and Nevada. This was going to be called the Pacific Republic. And that threatened Lincoln and all of the North uh, with more dis dismemberment that created quite a bit of paranoia because of all the actions going on in California. Here's from a book, uh, California in 1861, and it's a book I don't recommend that you read because of the facts. I recommend that it be read because of the emotion. It shows the emotion of the era. And this is true. U.S. Senator Gwynn of California was arrested for treason. Uh, and it's alleged there that the South owned the state and federal offices, and in some cases they did. Uh, this author <laughs> calls uh, President Buchanan an imbecile, and that we had a traitor as a Secretary of War. And there was some truth by Mr. Floyd, the Secretary of War, having moved small arms and cannon from northern armories to southern army, armories just before they seceded. These armories were then overtaken by the South and, and basically he, he helped their military. Then there was a great concern in California about Albert Sidney Johnston, military commander of the West, who had known uh, Southern sympathies and he was alleged to be doing all sorts of treachery in California. In truth, he handed over the armories, etc., in California in very fine shape to the Union. He then got in his horse and rode over to the South and became a general in the Southern Army, alleged to be one of their most competent, and uh, he died at Shiloh. Okay, this, from this paranoia, this fear, and all that activity came several objectives out of the Lincoln administration. One was to save the Union, and to do that, he was going to bind it together with rails, run that railroad right across the nation, and second of all, he was going to fill it up with free states. Uh, this goes clear back to a, 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 a few slides ago when you looked at that big empty. Uh, he was going to take control that so a civil war, a third civil war could not be done. Um, now let's look at the objectives. <laughs> Here's a quote from 20 years in Congress by James Blaine, a Secretary of State for the, the Nation. 
It was part of the fixed policy of Mr. Lincoln's administration to increase the number of distinctly free states from that section of the public domain which had never been in any way contaminated by the slaver, institution of slavery. What's most interesting about this is I was <coughs> going through an old bookstore and I saw this book on the shelf and I took it down and as you always do you pop it open and this quote was on the first page I read. Quite interesting, I bought the book. Okay, <laughs> this brought a horde of speculators, homesteaders, and railroad expansion. <clears throat> and here is a quote right out of Paul Gates' book. Because of all this land being pushed on the market at one time, it, it kept the price down. But here's the results are seen in the rapid development of the West, which it had thought earlier it would take one or two centuries. Now, he's saying it would take, that the, the, the development would have taken one or two centuries, and if you go back into some other articles, you find that the pinery was supposed to be inexhaustible. It would last for one or two centuries. So all of a sudden you have a collision here of a speed up of, of land available, a speed up of people on the land. If you take the populations of, of the Great Lakes and then the Great Plains, and if you look at them from 1860 to 1900, in 40 years, these states went from 4.5 million people to 15.7, an increase of almost 11 million people in just 40 years. Um, now, what did they need? They needed homes, barns, fences, boardwalks. In one single year during this period, the city of Minneapolis, you bought 8 million board feet of white pine for boardwalks. Uh, and the pinery supplied the need. If we take a look at Wisconsin lumber production in 1860, it was 375 million board feet for the year. After 1860, it actually, in 61, it dropped a, a bit because we were losing soldiers to the military effort. But if you look as it built up in 1892, our peak of lumber production, according to the Division of Forestry, uh, was 4.1 billion board feet. So <clears throat> the immigration sped up, the people moving in needed wood, and uh, the pinery was supplying that wood. And of course, this is the general area, if you add uh, Wyoming and Colorado, where the wood went to. And beginning in, early, in the earliest years, as you know, it went down the rivers and sometimes up the rivers. <laughs> and then we ended up with uh, railroads. Here's from the Great Plains, uh, the, the Great Lakes Lumber on the Great Plains by John Vogel, and he shows how it went in, in waves. And some of our lumber may have ended up in North Dakota, but for sure Iowa, Nebraska, uh, and that's where it went. The critical factor to keep in mind always is that Wisconsin pine was not used in Wisconsin except at the minority level. Sure, we built cities here, but they were the minority of all the cities that were built with pine. So what we had, or have, is that the issue of slavery uh, held up the use of the public domain for years and years. And then when it became clear through southern secession that slavery would end, or that the secession, that this nation would be split, they could see the end of slavery. Then fear and paranoia took over, particularly in the north, and caused a rush to elevate land use policy up to the level of military policy because they were saving the nation. We're binding it and saving it. And then that created the White Pine era. Um, that period from 1860, 61, 62 uh, to the end. In summary, Southern Secession was the first act in the Civil War. That act allowed the North to enact policy re related to the public domain which opened vast areas to settlement. In normal times, these areas would have been settled over a long period of time, perhaps a century or two. 
But the war created fears that were compounded by attitudes and actions of citizens both north and south. <clears throat> the war plus the fears caused a settlement right now uh, fever to occur. This demanded white pine for the human habitat. And the white pine fell. And it fell in an often wasteful manner in a little over 40 years. The bottom line is that Wisconsin's white pine forests were sacrificed for an acute national goal. This was not business as usual. Often, lumbermen have been labeled with very derogatory terms, robber barons, plunderers. But think a minute. Were they in control? Or were they merely bit players in a national mega event? And I think, frankly, they did not have control. They're, they're viewed as being powerful in their communities, but the national events were going and whipping, and they just, if it wasn't for this individual, it would have been 10 others. Um, <clears throat> I do have one question. Do you know who, who caused the plunder of the pinery? Write down, can you imagine it in your head? This is who caused the plunder of the pinery. Oop. That little lady sitting out in the middle of Nebraska in a sod hut with centipedes and snakes and mice running across her feet, put the squeeze on dead and said, we're having a house with wood floors and shingles. Yes, it was the human habitat that caused the white pine. So if you can find this little old lady, you blame her for it. <laughs> and we'll take questions if you have questions. If you need to stand up and shake a leg, I understand that too.